Welcome to Tampa Home Talk with your host, native Tampa real estate girl, Katrina Madewell, a full-time, passionate, out-of-the-box thinker, love for home ownership kind of realtor with over 21 years of combined mortgage and real estate experience. Tune in every week at this time for expert advice on everything you need to know about home ownership, finance, maintaining great credit, building wealth, and making your everyday life better, and how you can be financially successful successful today and tomorrow. Remember, love where you live or let Katrina fix it. Now, here's your host of Tampa Home Talk, Katrina Madewell. Good afternoon. Welcome to Tampa Home Talk. Thank you so much for joining us today. You can catch us here every Thursday and Saturday at 5 p.m., 1340, 1350, and 1400. We've got a great show lined up for you today, and we are taking your questions. You can tweet them to us at Tampa Home Talk. You can also post them on our Facebook page, which is Tampa Home Talk. And we will be happy to answer them on air today. Our off-air call-in number, if you would like to reach us, is 813 813- 936-2302. Again, want to jot that down, 813-936-2302. So we've had a lot of questions that we get all the time around home buying and the home buying process and the first time home buyer and what goes into that. The rules of buying have changed for sure. Anybody that's bought at the peak of the market and has tried to do that again realizes that you no longer have to just fog up a mirror in order to get a loan. You actually have to have an ability to qualify. Imagine that. (laughs) So we'll have some, we'll take some calls and answer some questions as we go today. But I thought, first of all, I would explain what a first-time home buyer is. Like, what's the definition of first-time home buyer? And that would be anybody that has not owned a home before or in the prior three years. And there's a lot of different down payment assistance programs and different programs that you might qualify for if you have not owned a home in the last three years. So, in studio today, I actually have my... A special guest. My mom's hanging out in the studio. We got some family that's in town. Mom, my mother in law. So Monique, Chrissy, I'm probably gonna see if they can hop on air with us today. But um, and we got some questions that are gonna come in. And I know Chris, you're pr- gonna chime in and give me a couple too as well. But so some of the questions and a lot of this prompted from Lori Zook show. She's here at Tan Talk on what Saturdays at eleven? Is that right? No, tonight at ten. Oh, tonight at ten. Thursdays at yes. ten. Leave it to me to get it right. Thanks, Chris. Tonight at 10 o'clock. I got your back. So um, it was just a great show. I think she's airing that one. A lot of similar content in the future. But, you know, some of the things we talked about was pre-qualifying versus being pre-approved. And so pre-qualifying versus pre- being pre-approved means someone has either just ran yeah. quick numbers and a credit report and that kind of stuff versus actually verifying a lot of your documentation. So there's a big difference between pre-qualify and pre-approved. And so essentially you want to make sure that you're actually pre-approved, especially if you're self-employed or anything like that. Cause essentially when you, as with your self-employed, you have to think about write-offs, right? Every self-employed person has that stuff. And essentially if you're writing stuff off, they're only going to give you credit for whatever the net income is going to be, not including anything that you grossed. So minus those expenses, we're going to give you credit for, and they're going to average it out over a couple of years. So, and the, did you get questions that came in, Chris? I do have some. I'm actually a first time home buyer. Well, give me one. What do you got? What what's the first step? What's my first step? First step I would say is to get pre-approved before you do anything, before you even start looking. Okay. Even if you're a year out, we tell people to get pre-approved, which is kind of what I mentioned a minute ago. Have your credit report pulled. Make sure there's something on there that's no surprises, especially if you have a common name. It's it's not uncommon that we see juniors and seniors with mixed credit. So there's a lot of reasons why you might want to have a look at your credit report. Some of the rules have actually changed, too, from prior years. Like, the for example, the lenders used to disregard medical collections, and now they don't. They actually pay attention to those, and a lot of times they have to be paid off or settled. There's different circumstances, but they're going to look at your debt-to-income ratios. They're going to look at your housing history. So, for example, right now, if you're renting, Chris, you might want to make sure you're writing a check for your rent as opposed 
opposed to giving your landlord cash Why? or because if you especially if you have a limited amount of credit and i don't know if that's your situation but they always like to reference that history for the last 12 months especially if it's not with like an apartment complex or a property manager they are going to want to track that and it's not uncommon for them to ask you to pull 12 months of your prior rental history via canceled checks Okay. I would have never thought about that. Exactly. So get pre-approved, even if you say, hey, my, I just signed a lease and I'm not going to be ready to move here for another year. That way, if there's any little hiccups on the credit or anything like that, we have plenty of time to fix it and get that stuff off of there. And okay. the but other thing too, go ahead. What? So I go through all that. I pull my credit scores. I, I have all those ducks in a row. How do I know if I'm actually ready? Like, it's one thing to actually go and do all that stuff, but what well, if I do all that and I'm not ready and I think I am? Well, the next thing is essentially you're going to want to make sure whatever you think you're ready for, you qualify for. Okay. And so you're going to take that and look at whatever your rent payment is. What's your rent payment? Uh, 700. Okay. So we're going to look at what your rent payment is, look at your income and then calculate how much you qualify for. Okay. Based on that, we're going to let you know. And they also have funky little underwriting terms like payment shock and stuff like that. If your payment adjusts too much, yeah, underwriting looks at those things. That's gibberish to me. Exactly. So some of the benefits that you like, well, there's detriments and benefits, right? So how do you know if you're ready? That was a good question. So to tag on to that, not only do you want to know what you're qualified for, and we recommend once you know what that number is, we'll go ahead and set you up on a portal. That way you can kind of look online, right? You're going to window shop. Sometimes people window shop for a year or more before they ever even take the next step and start physically looking inside properties. And that's really good if you're doing that because then you get an idea how much stuff costs, right? right. If you want to buy a truck and you're pricing f-150s but you're not quite ready to buy it but you know in the next year you want to buy an f-150 you're probably going to pick up an auto trader and start looking through there even though you're not physically test driving any trucks you're going to start looking at those vehicles to get an idea of how much they cost for what year for what miles just to get a general idea but now i'm impulsive so when I pick up that auto trader and I start looking at that Ford F-150. You're ready to go test drive a it. A week later, that Ford F-150 is in my driveway. So people like me help keep you grounded so that we can set you up for success so and, that you don't and, fail. And that's exactly it. I'm, I'm, I am I'm understand that. I just can't that's do anything about it. That's why you don't want to look. <laughs> yeah, I, I you know. So the other thing too, let's talk about down payment because that's another issue that we get all the time. People ask those type of questions and we have everything from small to zero amount all the way up to bigger percentages requiring different different um, scenarios. So for example, some of the best programs we have that are zero down, obviously if you're a veteran and you've served the country and you've got a DD-214 showing that you've had honorable discharge, you can buy a home here and anywhere with zero down payment. And the VA will guarantee that you will make that payment on time. Their, their theory is, hey, if you served in the military, you got honorable discharge, you did your part, we're going to guarantee a loan for you when you come back. And that's something that they started after the, the wars many years ago. And so essentially, we see a lot of our veterans, they might give an escrow deposit of 500 bucks, And then sometimes they don't have to bring anything else to the closing table. Like, that's it. Okay, now I've always, I guess thought or been told maybe not by the correct people that 20 percent is what you want to put down a lot of people tell you that and i'll tell you why not yet though after the next segment because I'll tell they you get, why. because they get more in their pocket no that's so not what? why it's okay. not why actually i'll tell you there's a reason why the whole 20 percent comes into play <laughs> okay so the next thing like if you're still looking for let's say you're looking for a zero down program but you're not a veteran so you haven't served the country you don't have a dd214 the next best program probably would be the usda the rural housing program now if you live in clearwater or pinellas county you're out you're not going to be eligible for that why because the whole area is no longer considered rural and it hasn't been for years so us USDA will not, it's a government product that will not guarantee that. It's very much based on census and where you're located as well as income. There's some income restrictions, but they're pretty high, I think. Do they just break it down rural and urban? Pretty much, yeah. There's literally a map. Just one or the other? You plug the map in, the map will tell you if that area is eligible or not. Like right now, if you're looking at a map of Tampa, essentially it's going to be like where the Veterans Expressway is when you get near like Trinity area, Newport Ritchie, all that area is still out. You have to be on the east side of the expressway, the Sun Coast, and then it keeps going. And really, really right about where County Line Road is, between Hillsborough and Pasco County, mm -hmm. that area still qualifies. And believe it or not, some of New Tampa still qualifies. And so now it's better to be 
rural. Well, here's I would the, here's the thing I like about that product, and here's where the twenty percent comes into play, which I'm still not going to explain yet, but I will. It doesn't have what they call mortgage insurance, and so mortgage insurance. All right, I'll dive in. They say twenty percent down. <laughs> Got you. I can't help it. Twenty percent down because that helps you eliminate PMI or private mortgage insurance or MIP if it's a government loan. And some people think, oh, I have mortgage insurance. That's a good thing. If I die, my loan will be paid off. Negative. That's not how it works. So mortgage insurance, that's credit life. What people are thinking about. Mortgage insurance only insures the lender against default. So if you don't put 20% down, they make you buy this private mortgage insurance. It's mandatory so that if something happens or you default or you stop paying, they have an insurance policy to guarantee that when they take the house back and resell it, they're not going to be in a negative position. They won't lose money. Okay. Now I didn't even, I didn't know any of that aspect of the 20% down for me. I just assume putting 20% down is great because it's a, you know, you get a less, a, a shorter term, you get well, not maybe a better interest rate or you get less not than your financing. Right. And people think it's another good point too, that you actually just touched on. Sometimes we have people like older people. I've had people in their fifties and sixties that come to us and they're buying their house for the first time. And they're like, I want to see if I can qualify. Cause I know I can't get a 30 year mortgage, but I just want to see how, how, you know, if I can afford a 15 year payment and that's a complete misconception. So okay. that is not accurate at all. It doesn't matter if you're 85 years old, the bank cannot deny you from getting the 30 year loan. They cannot. Okay. Now, if I were, how do you, how do you determine how much house you can buy? So the rough rule of thumb is 28% housing ratio, 30% back end. And how you calculate that. Now what does that mean? I'm going to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> so if you I told have, you this was gibberish. <laughs> I know, right? So roughly speaking, like, let's say, give me a generic income figure for the month. Just give me a generic. For the month? Yeah, the gross, year. gross monthly income per month before taxes. Okay. How about 2000 so $2,000. Okay. So if we're working with $2,000 a month, gross monthly, they are actually going to take 28% of that figure. I'm looking for a calculator on this darn thing. But 28% of whatever $2,000 is, is what your housing allowance should be. And, and there's nothing to say that they won't actually go higher than that. But those are the general rule of thumbs that they look for whenever they're trying to calculate you. Okay. So $2,000 a month times 28%. $560. housing payment. And that's total. Principal, interest, taxes, insurance. Okay. So that's, in theory, how much you could afford if you were... That's your payment. Okay. Yeah. Now, keep in mind, when interest rates go up, right now they're really low. But as interest rates rise... Um, then your buying power goes down. So that means, you know, right now we're seeing rates in the high threes, low fours. Once those rates hike up to five, six, seven, I mean, when I started in the industry, they were 12%. And, you know, you ask your parents, they might've told you they were 18 or 20. What's and, a good interest rate now? You know, it's it's kind of like saying, I want to buy stock in Apple. What's the price of the stock? Well, it depends on exactly when you buy it because it's a publicly traded company and it trades. It's the same okay. thing. Bonds trade with Wall Street. And so that's going to change the cost of money. Like basically the way it works is the Federal Reserve essentially borrows. They buy money at a certain price. Right. And then they relend it to make their profit. And right now the Federal Reserve is almost zero. I think it's like I'd have to look it up to see, but it's like 0.25 or a half. That's how much they buy. That's by my, they borrow money at that rate and then relend it at like three, three and a half, four percent. Okay. Now, in determining my interest rate, is there anything other than my credit score that is going to change that? Absolutely. If I put more money down, can I? Can they lower my interest rate well, because I'm putting more money down? Not really. It wouldn't change as much as one would think. They do have uh, pricing calculators like in the background where they plug that stuff in, like your loan to value is what you're talking about. Meaning, okay, if I went FHA and I put 3.5% down versus conventional putting 20% down, essentially you're taking that amount and it's it's not the government rates, believe it or not, at 3.5% for FHA are better than conventional. Okay. Because they're government-backed loans. If I said to you that I had $25,000 to put down on a house okay, and I made $40,000 a year, okay. So what is the, what is the maximum value house that I'm looking at? Well, $40,000 a year. 
Um, divided by 12, they're going to give you a gross monthly income credit of 33.33. Okay. And 33 cents. And so, essentially, based on that, they want your housing ratio to be around 28%. Okay. So, that exact number is like 933. So, I would say you probably would qualify for about $1,000 a month. So, let's say, um, in, in their back end ratio, a, a month, month housing payment. Yeah, total payment. So, my monthly mortgage payment could be up to $1,000? Roughly, yeah. Now, if you didn't have any other debt, like let's say you didn't have a car loan, you don't have any credit cards, you don't have student loans, you have no other debt, they can give you a little bit of leeway and essentially look at that back-end ratio, which allows for those other things. Like, that's the difference between the 28 and the 36%. And we, in recent years, we've seen where it goes through automated underwriting. It's like a computer underwriter. They put all the data in, and it kind of spits out what they call an accept or a refer. Accept means they're going to approve it. Refer means it doesn't like something about it. Okay. And so sometimes they can manipulate that system to fix whatever it is. Sometimes it's down payment. Sometimes it's debt. Sometimes it's credit score. Um, it might have a collection in there. It didn't like that they left open they might want to see that balance at zero before it would take it so that's one of the things that we would do would be to put it in automated underwriting to see what's going to take because that's what makes a loan saleable and that's what ha- that's how the lenders make their money they package these up in in multiples of a million dollars two million dollars five million dollars and they resell them on the secondary market so what that means to the consumer is like let's say you're paying your mortgage payment and they go oh they sold my loan i had uh bb and t now i have wells fargo or chase or any you know any of the big dogs that service loans that's what they've done they've bought your loan in the middle of a bunch of other securities and and they're servicing it they're called a servicing lender at that point okay now again this may not work for me because like i said i am very impulsive Mm -hmm. but for the people that are very good about this process Mm -hmm. which i would probably say that i am not one of them if you are just window shopping and you are looking for six months or a year or two years like you said how do you know where that maximum is like total how like if the house is a hundred and twenty five thousand dollar house is that too much house for that price range right no i think you'd be right in line you probably have a lot of wiggle room and so and that's a crazy thing is like it may you may look at one house that's one hundred twenty five thousand, and another one's one hundred twenty five thousand, and the payments might be very different and why so, well because there's going to be a number of things that can affect it the main thing that would change would be your taxes and your insurance okay and where the community's located I was like say zoning or whatever well sometimes i mean the munici- municipalities and how they're zoned have different tax millage different tax millages warrant different tax rates so yes that is part of it but it's a very small part of it we also have what we call um, homestead exemption here so for example let's use the hundred and twenty five thousand dollar house that you gave as an example okay if if you file for homestead exemption they will likely take fifty thousand dollar exemption off of that which means you're only going to get tax assessed at seventy five thousand so at that point, and, and since our taxes are paid in arrears, meaning when we get the tax bill at the end of the year, it's going to be for the whole year that has already passed. Okay. So let's say, you know, you're buying a home mid-March, okay? We're, they're going to use the tax bill based on last year. Now that may or may not have homestead exemption. So if it's a bank-owned property, the homestead exemption is probably off, which means your payment's going to start out a little bit higher. And then after you file for homestead exemption and your tax adjust, your payment's going to go down because you've got that exemption on the property the bank's not able to get because they don't live in it. Um, another thing that might affect it would be the age of the home. Not only the age of the home, but also um, when it was built, how many upgrades and improvements have been made. You know, insurance companies, they now require what they call a four-point inspection. And so the four-point inspection is going to look at those four key points that insurance companies look for to be upgraded. So your electrical panel, your plumbing, your roof, and your AC system. They want those things to be in working order. And if those things have been upgraded, then they know your house is, is nicely insurable. If you haven't had those, or let's say, you know, in the roof it's got to have two to three years remaining life or you're not getting a loan or insurance anywhere so that's it's another little piece to take into consideration just the roof just the roof yeah but there's a number of things like let's say you have a a home like my mom for example she had an old home with a knob and tube wiring remember that that talking here because you can't hear it Made on telephone poles. Yeah, so the knob and tube wiring, thats they won't even insure that. Like, you can't get an insurance carrier in the world to carry it because it's a very old, outdated electrical system. They consider it a fire hazard. And every 70 years, an older home, they ask you to do a four-point inspection again. Yeah, they're going to have you... if it's an older home. 
Yeah, they want you to keep updating and talking to the mic because nobody can hear you like in the background. <laughs> Listen, my voice is not good today, anyhow. <laughs> so, anyhow, that's something else that. So, if you bought a newer home, Chris, one that's really nicely insulated, you know, or it's a lot newer, like let's say you bought something in the 70s or 80s compared to something built in 1930, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> The building codes have changed. I mean, look at look at when Hurricane Andrew hit Miami. I forget what year that was, but it was early 90s. Yeah, 93, and then, 94. Yeah, maybe? and then after that, remember we had the back-to-back hurricanes, what, 10 years later? Well, I wasn't so, here yet. Well, the building codes changed, is my point. Like, okay. every, every time those major storms come through, they change the building codes. So they're going to, and the way the insurance companies do it now is they start your premium up here. It might start at like two grand or 3000 or whatever. And then they're going to give you credits based on what you have. So, like, if your electrical has been upgraded or you have a new roof, all those things are going to give you credits. And that may bring a two or $3,000 premium down to eight, 900 bucks. Okay. I have two other things that I kind of want to touch on, but I think uh, we can probably get to that on the other side. Well, let's give a little teaser, and then we're going to take a break, and we'll answer that when we come back. What's the question? Um, one is foreclosures. Okay. Um, and, you know, obviously, I, I hear people talk all the time about getting a better deal because the house is in foreclosure. Um, so I, I wanna- love that. I love that thought, and we are going to answer that question as soon as we come back from a break. We'll be back in a minute. You've heard this before. Interest rates are at all-time record lows. But if your interest rate is 4% or above, you owe it to yourself to call Silverton Mortgage Specialist. Silverton is a direct lender, and the best part about this is that the entire loan process is handled in-house. From application to close, we do it all in the same building, which means that our loans close fast and our clients know what's going on every step of the way. Our contact info is located on tampahometalk.com under radio show. What makes Silverton different? Products. We offer VA, FHA, USDA, and conventional loans pricing. Best rates with the lowest closing cost. Process everything in-house. It's handled right here and not outsourced to anyone that no one can reach. This way we can avoid surprises. Our people are simply the best, and we know you'll agree. What will closing Silverton Mortgage Specialist mean to you? A smooth process, real home loan value, and personal attention from real professionals. Silverton Mortgage Specialists are here to serve you. Visit TampaHomeTalk.com under Radio Show for all of our contact details. NMLS 109600 is an equal housing lender and Florida and Georgia residential mortgage licensee. Aaron Davis here, owner of Hillsboro Title, serving all of Tampa Bay. Our service strength and knowledge make us different. From Polk County to the Gulf, Pasco to Manatee, Tampa Bay, we've got you covered. Visit us on the web at thebesttitle.com. That's thebesttitle.com. Welcome back. You're listening to Tampa Home Talk. Thanks so much for joining us today. You can catch us here, same time, same place, every Thursday and Saturday at 5 p.m. We're also available across the web on Facebook and Twitter. Just look for us at Tampa Home Talk. And you can catch all of our shows via a podcast. So if you miss any of our lovely conversation today, you can catch the whole show in its entirety. So, during the break, the whole I had a question come up because when we started the earlier segment, we were talking about what classifies a first time home buyer. And so sometimes people think, oh, well, I owned a home a long time ago, or I got foreclosed on, or I sold that home, so I'm no longer eligible. They classify the first time home buyer as someone that has either never owned a home or has not owned a home in the last three years. So as long as you have not owned a home from this date to three years back, anytime prior doesn't matter. You're now a first time home buyer. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify that because I think there was some misconception around. Yeah, that. I would never. I would assume you had to be a first-time homeowner. How but long between? That's good. If you have a foreclosure, and you so have for to wait the three years. So there, I got a couple extra guests. I got how many? One, two, three, four, five guests in the studio that none of them want to talk. So we're going <laughs> to answer. Is, quite- <laughs> if you've been foreclosed on, how long do you have to wait? You have to wait the three years to go in to be a. 
foreclosures usually they're going to want to it depends on the scenario fha lets you repurchase again after two years and keep in mind you know from the at the time of this recording those rules can change like fha can change stuff on a whim next week and those rules can be different i will tell you that if you've had any issues like a bankruptcy or a foreclosure they're going to be looking very closely at your housing history so for example if you had a foreclosure you should pay definitely with canceled checks because they're going to be looking for your on-time payment history. Well, supposing your foreclosure had a sinkhole. You know, every they do look at extenuating circumstances, and so they may put a letter of explanation in there. But the general good guidelines, like even conventional, it has to be three years. They won't let you purchase again without it. Now, people do purchase with private money, which was something I was going to talk about a little bit later. We have private money investors that will lend you can put, for example, thirty five percent down, and it doesn't. It has. It doesn't matter. You could have filed bankruptcy yesterday. You can still get a loan. And what kind of rate do they get? The rate's going to be higher. I mean, you've got an investor. How much higher? Oh, it depends. The investors let us know. I mean, those are going to be. You know, you can borrow conventional money right now for roughly four percent, give or take. You know, depending on the scenario. So you're looking at at least probably ten percent. You know, it's private money. You got somebody that's going to give you a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, however much you're asking for. You know, they're they're probably moving that money from the stock market or another place and putting them into private funds. So you have to just keep that in mind. It's it's risk, right? And if the bank won't give you a loan. There's a reason, right? There's something they don't like on it. So someone else is willing to take that risk right. with a higher rate of return. If you were lending your money, you'd be looking for the same thing. Absolutely. Is, we have a caller with a question? Yeah, we do. Call, are you there? Hey, Katrina. It's Echo and Emily. Hi there. Hi, how are you? Good. Welcome hey. to Tampa Home Talk. Hi. We just wanted to say hello and see how it's going today. Where's your first time home buyer question? Well, I had actually wrote some down because I get this very often is some of these questions um, like, you know, if I have a low credit score um, and I don't have much to put down, how do I know that I can qualify for a home? And that's a good question, too, because sometimes people will think that their credit score is low. And then when we actually pull it, it's not as low as they think. So, you know, conventional guidelines and FHA, here's what they say. They tell you they'll go down to a 580, but I can tell you those loans are very hard to do. They end up picking them apart and putting everybody through the ringer, might close, might not close, like 50-50 shot. Your credit score really ideally should be at 620 or higher to purchase. You know, we do get a lot of them through that are above the 600 mark, but, you know, to be honest with you, the last couple that we took that were under 600 were just that they were so hard it was it was like dragging the customer through mud and we're like we just made the decision as a company that we weren't going to write anything under 600 we were going to do what we could to help the client grab those 10 or 20 extra points because it's going to be a lot easier better on them and their experience is going to be so much better than if we try to drag them through a lender that's going to drag them through five rounds of conditions which doesn't make a lot of sense to you but essentially underwriters will do what they call condition the file which means they're going to give you a list of things they want you'll turn in all those things and they'll give you a list of 10 more things and you turn in those things they'll give you a list of 10 more things and you're like i just gave you a bank statement for the last six months can we close already like that's kind of how the scenario can go and they can take a very long time so i do not recommend it even if somebody says hey yeah we write credit scores all the way down to 580 guess what we could too but we want you to have a good experience and we're not going to drag you through that i would much much rather take the time and have the client, you know, help them get a little bit of patience. If there's somebody like you, Chris, that's impulsive and they want to buy right now, right now, yesterday, help them figure out a short term plan to get that score up as quickly as possible. And there's a lot of things we can do looking at the credit to tell you what to do to, to increase that score. Then your experience is going to be so much better going through the process than trying to, you know, drag you through it with a low credit score. How much money can you expect to save by raising your credit score? 20 points well i mean those those rates are higher again you know they're they're taking the risk so it might be anywhere from a half a percent to one percent from a credit score that's you know below 620 and like if you're above 720 they're going to give you a premium credit so that may actually sometimes bump you just an eighth lower on the interest it's an eighth it's 0.125 percent so it's not huge when you're talking about it but comparatively over 30 speaking, years right right if you add it up over 30 years it adds up yeah. right yeah absolutely 
I see these things like on Craigslist and stuff all the time, and I always think to myself like maybe that they're scams. But there's these little ads that you know they say, "Oh, any credit, you know, we can get you a house now." Uh, look at them, and I wonder, you know, what are they going to hit you with? What's the fine print on that? You know, if they were to if they were to get you in and and, and take you. In I mean, the first that's a good question. You know, for the 22 years that I've been doing this, I have seen a lot of crazy stuff like that, and even going back to myself, right? Because I wrote loans and mortgages from the time I was 18 years old. I remember responding to something like that because I didn't, you know, at the time I didn't even realize there was a USDA housing product. I just, you know, I did loans, but I wasn't. I was very young at the time. So yeah. looking back, I mean, I responded to a couple of those, and I can tell you when I read the fine print, it was not good. I mean, some of the ones well, that I they prey on that's they right prey on these people that don't know any better right. and you know these people that a lot of young people and you know people that, that just don't read the fine mm-hmm. print and just go blindly into it and i'm one of those people you know i'm not an impulsive buyer i'm i have to pick everything to death before i commit to anything and so uh, of course you know i'm going to look into it further but they don't want people like that they want people to just you know go ahead and commit without even right. knowing what the what the details are and, and well, you could really you could really hurt yourself there the ones that i've seen are like that and the other thing you have to be leery of too is sometimes it's not even their house we see this all the time the people will try oh, yeah. to intercept that money it's not even their house to rent or sell yeah. and then they're That's gone and you're like story. hey i gave you deposit what happened that should always be placed through a title company or an attorney you should never but give I think it's worth it i mean in my opinion i think it's worth it if you if it, you know if you are considering buying a house it's not that hard to work on your credit score like even if you have a low score now right i mean if it's something that you're planning on you know you have to put some planning into it and if you're planning on buying a house let's say within the next year i mean you can take that year and work on building your credit up because it's not that's, that's right. Do. I mean, let's say you're even if you're even at like a 300 if you have a really bad score. I mean, you can take I don't that believe it or not. I don't think I've ever seen a 300, which is good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you can you can bump it up though. You I mean just work on it little by little and yeah. when you're ready, you know, it makes it that much easier. Y- you'd be surprised. I mean, a lot of times when we run credit reports, we may look at a credit and, you know, somebody may have a $1000 limit on a credit card, but they've got $900 on there. And if they're at or over limit, that's going to significantly impact the score. I mean, that may bump you down 25 to 30 points, right? And we're talking about these ones where we're trying to grab 5, 10, 15 points. You can see how that would be easy. So a lot of times if we're just trying to grab a few points and somebody has credit cards, we'll have them pay that account like down to $10 or almost all the way off. A general rule of thumb is if you have credit cards and we're not big advocates of credit, we want you to pay cash cash for everything if you can but you want to keep that balance 50 percent or less and then really pay it off if you can you know if you're trying to establish credit to buy a house it's a real good idea to have that stuff available because you want to have at least three trade lines if you if you can you know and they'll use yeah. rent as one of those like non-traditional housing that kind of stuff yeah and i was um you know talking and uh, i've heard now that actually buying a home now even at being a first-time home buyer it's a lot more inexpensive, I guess, if you will. I, I think rent is going up this year, supposedly, and it's yep. going to be, you know, a lot, a lot more expensive to rent than it is to well, buy. Well, that's so what they call inflation, you know, and the hedge funds are still here purchasing, so that's a good sign because that means that the rent prices are still going to continue to go up. And if you can yeah. buy now while the interest rates are as low as they are, that's a win-win because, you know, your right. housing payment really is not going to ever change very much. It, it'll change a little bit based on your taxes and your insurance, um, but it's very minimal. We have the Save Our Homes exemption, so it can't go up any more than 3% per year, and that's of the tax bill. Yeah. So thanks for calling in, ladies. And, you are very welcome. Any thanks more questions? Um, no, that's all. Oh, well, yeah. she might have something. Um, Katrina, do you want to talk about, like, um, a lot of people asked about student loans. Does it hurt their chance to get a loan? Student loans are a good one because a lot of times we'll see them come in where they're in deferment. And it's one of those tricky things that you should leave alone until you talk to your loan officer and we'll guide you exactly correct. Because what happens is... If we're not counting, and it has to be deferred for 12 months to not count it against you. And anybody that's been in school and has a student loan will tell you they only defer for 12 months at a time. So you're thinking, well, how am I going to do that? Real simple. Right before they go to give you a loan, you're going to put it back into deferment. They're going to re-verify it and then push you on through. All right. Yes, thank you for answering that. 
That's a good one we get all the time. I know we had someone else call earlier that was asking about self-employment and and getting a loan when you're self-employed. And we see this one a lot. And it's not like a regular W-2 income employee. You know, if you get a 1099 and you're self-employed, they're going to want to see all of that income basically they're going to look at your after your expenses so you know if you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year but you're taking eighty thousand in expenses they're going to give you credit for 20 (laughs) and they're going to average that over two years and sometimes you know we see a lot of times with our self-employed buyers they may have to wait a year or two to buy because they're going to average their tax returns over a couple year period. And it's a lot of it's very strategic. They have to plan on exactly what they're going to show. You know, they have to run numbers with their CPA to make sure they get it right and then run it through underwriting because I mean, I'm talking every I has to be dotted, every T has to be crossed. Right. And that's, yeah, another question, you know, or something I wanted you to bring up was that's why it's so important to get pre-approved before we show you home. Absolutely. We talked about that in the beginning. You know, if you ever have an agent that is showing you properties and you haven't been fully pre-approved, I would say buyer beware because there's no agent that has been doing this for any period of time that knows a lot about contracts, that knows a lot about all the ins and the outs. They're not going to take you to see properties. A, we have a due diligence as a real tour, which means we abide by a certain code of ethics and we can't just take people through sellers' homes that haven't been pre-approved. And, you know, you have to look at this from the seller's perspective too. We're asking the seller to vacate their property. Sometimes that means swooping up a couple of kids two three dogs and they have to you know keep the house clean get everybody out and vacate for an hour while someone comes between 6 and 7 p.m right which is right at dinner time it's not the most convenient thing to sell a house so we have a due diligence as agents to make sure that the people we are taking through the home are qualified and they're approved you know and in any smart age i mean look at the news right we've seen these agents that get killed in properties those are people who i you know we call them pop tart agents that's our that's our background like the pop tart agents so they call and says oh i want to look at one two three main street okay i'll be right there like there's not a whole lot of like you're setting yourself up for a disaster you know you have no idea who that person is you have no idea if they're trying to just see the inside of the home to come back later and rob it i mean there's so many things and so many reasons why you would not want to just meet somebody to property and run it and show it to them and you know if you're if you're not getting a loan you're paying cash that's fine too but you know we're going to be looking for proof of funds because the seller is going to be looking for it too Right. So, you know, your good agents are going to be asking those things that they ask you to be, get pre-approved. It's not because they're being nosy. It's not because they're being pushy. They just want to make sure they're looking out for you and your best interest. You know, if they take you and they show you a two hundred thousand dollar house and you're only qualified for one twenty five, guess what? You're not going to like anything at one twenty five when you looked at two hundred thousand dollar houses. <laughs> so, I mean, it's you know, you can't have champagne taste on a beer budget. So, you got to get whatever that budget is in the beginning and get that all ironed out so that you can make one work that's within your budget. And you got to start somewhere, right? You can always trade up later. Any more questions? Good show. Oh, I think they're on. Well, I know that um, when Lori was on, we didn't have a whole lot of a chance to talk about this, so I thought I would share it today. But we get often asked a lot of times, what's the difference between a deed, a mortgage, a note, a loan, all of that stuff? And there's there's pretty substantial difference in them, you know. And I was talking about Florida being a lien theory state, which means as opposed to uh, places like Georgia and some other states, you have to pay the entire house off before you get the deed to the property. Those are what we call title theory states. In Florida, we're a lien theory state. So that means essentially they will go ahead and give you the money and the deed. And then they're basically going to secure their interest, meaning make sure you pay them back (laughs) by recording a mortgage on the property. That's their security instrument or the collateral that says, hey, if you pay, you stay. If you don't, you won't. And so (laughs) fair enough. (laughs) That's right. And it's about 14 or 15 pages that let you know that. And, and no one ever wants to read that's that. right you know i think i'll do a whole show just on what the mortgage says and what those provisions are because i could probably read them in my sleep yeah because there's not enough paperwork and documents and signing well people always say what is this it's 14 or 15 pages and you're telling me if i stay if i pay i stay if i don't i won't that's right you know but there's a lot of other things in there like one of the things i saw them change in mortgages over the recent years was the provision that if you're in default on the loan or the mortgage 
you can't collect rent payments from a tenant. The bank will intercept those fees now and take it to put it on your loan. That's something really? they've changed recently. And in prior years, that was never on there. So, you know, you have a crazy scenario like we've had over the last several years after following the housing meltdown, and you have people that have been in their home for two, three years. You know, you have attorneys trying to sue for discovery, which can be another whole show in itself. But that, they can stall that, that process. And, you know, at the beginning of 2015, which is where we're at now, they essentially are going to, they're pushing a lot of that stuff out of the system. So we don't expect them to stall too much longer. In a normal market, after 90 days, you can pretty much expect to be kicked out. But that hasn't been the case in the last several years. So you do see often situations where the homeowner, like you said, is renting the house. They're getting the rent payments Mm -hmm. from the renter. Yep. Which should be then going towards the bank, the the mortgage. But it's not. That would be morals. So <laughs> now, does this happen a lot? Where um, it has now, the owner is basically going into foreclosure, and the renter has no idea what's going I'm, on. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm going to talk about that. What does the renter do? It's not they didn't do anything wrong. Well, I had a scenario. They've actually, got a sketchy. That's homeowner. right. But here's the thing, and here's the way the courts look at it. The courts look at that scenario, even though one would think the renter is paying their rent, they should be paying the mortgage. The courts can look at that as two separate contracts with two completely different parties that have nothing to do with each other. Which so means what? The bank's contract, which is a mortgage, right? They have yeah. a mortgage contract and the promissory note. That's what the note is. says that's your agreement to repay this money that we've lent you. If you don't, the mortgage is what allows us to take it back. That essentially is, that's their contract with the bank. So the seller or the homeowner has made a contract with the bank to make these payments of X amount over 30 years, and then the house is theirs, they, there's no more lien. Right. That's their agreement and their contract with the bank. Now, if the homeowner decides, you know, this house is too small, I'm taking a job out of state, whatever it is, and they want to rent their home, they entirely have the rights to do that. That's a provision in the mortgage that says they have the rights to do that. And this is the little thing that they've changed, because what would happen is, you know, the homeowner wasn't paying their mortgage, yet the tenant had been faithfully paying their rent on time. You know, they want to pay it 10 days late and the landlord wants to charge them a late fee, which they can. It's completely in the lease. But the court's going to see that as two separate contracts and they're not going to all they did was they did pass tenant rights they did that a while back that says if you're renting for fair market rent and the bank comes in and forecloses then they're going to start collecting your payments but what what does it mean that they're going to see they're going to see it as two separate contracts but what does that mean so you have a homeowner and a renter right a tenant yeah and they are signing a lease with each other that Homeowner Bob is going to rent to Sally Joe as a tenant, and they're they're going to give her you know peace and quiet and enjoyment and use the premises, unlimited use of the premises as long as she's not using it for anything illegal. You know, right. there's a little provisions in the lease. She has free rights to this property as if it's her own, just to care for it over the period of 12 months for $1,000 a month, and that's her contract. At the end of that contract, the seller or the homeowner doesn't have to renew that lease. But Sally Joe's not on the hook for anything, right? She, well, they have to fulfill their term of the lease. So if they signed a lease for 12 months, they have to pay that lease for 12 months. So let's say the homeowner goes into foreclosure. Let's say the house goes into foreclosure, and, and the homeowner basically loses the house in now the tenant, June. Now, the tenant says, the tenant landlord law that has been passed, and I'm not preaching law, you know, we can connect you with a real estate attorney if you want to get this information. But in short, the way it's been explained to me is it would protect them. So if they had a lease from June till June and the bank forecloses in May or April, the bank has to give them to the rest of the term of their lease. Unless they're renting it for 200 bucks or something that's not fair market rent, then they say, well, this is clearly probably a non-arm's length transaction on this lease, which means they're renting it to their cousin for $200 or whatever. How long did you pass that law? That happened, I'd have to look to see, it's called the Landlord-Tenant Act, and it, it passed uh, several years back, I don't know exactly when, but when a lot of this stuff started happening, that's when they passed it, and we had a client actually one time that wanted to buy the property that she was in, and something happened with her and the guy, the landlord, and we don't really know the details, but I know that she, you know, when, when you go into the fault, they will send either a process server or a sheriff to the door mm-hmm. to try and serve you your legal notice and file your list pendants, meaning they're starting the foreclosure process. So sometimes what happens if the property is being rented, the tenant will be the one that receives that list pendants notice. Right. And they call the landlord and they go, hey, what's going on? Your mortgage is attached. It says you're in default. Why aren't you paying your payments? Do I have to get out? And they start freaking out. I've well, been paying you on time. Right. Well, you know. Exactly. So 
So we had a client one time that, you know, she was upset. The homeowner wouldn't make any repairs. There was all this stuff that was going on. So she said, you know what? I'm going to put the money into escrow. And essentially, whenever we get this figured out, the money will be there. He can go to him or whatever. She actually got sued by the homeowner for not paying her rent and not fulfilling the term of the lease. She got sued and she won. Or the homeowner won. The tenant lost because they viewed it as two separate contracts and she didn't fulfill her contract as a tenant. Wow. See, I learned. And he, he won. She got a judgment placed against her and she had to go private money. One of those ones we were talking about with like 30% down. Yeah. She had to go private money until that, you know, she got that taken care of. Do you see that a lot? No, that was a rare instance, but it has happened. I can't imagine. I, 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 you mean, you seem like you're doing nothing wrong. And a lot of people, I would imagine a lot of people don't even know. They don't. And you have no idea. I'm paying my rent every right. month for three or four years. And it may have been a while before that happened. Yeah, I have no idea. Now all of a sudden I've got a month to get out. The other thing we see too is people will go into a lease and they'll, they'll say, oh yeah, you can stay here as long as you want. Yeah, we're planning to rent it forever. We have a homeowner or a client right now. He They're in the process of buying. They're looking with our team and they he thought they were going to be there for a long time they've been there for like three or four years well they just found out that you know the lady got remarried then her husband passed away she was living with him well now she wants her house back so guess what she has fully entitled to do that at the end of the term of the lease she can completely get her house back and move back into it rent it to somebody else she can do whatever she wants to do after the end of that lease term and and if you sign a lease for longer than a year it's not binding in the state of florida a lot of people don't know that either crazy so i gotta ask because we i this is like one of the things that's because me personally i will soon be looking at getting a house buying a house and we teased this a little while ago but is it better to look at houses that are foreclosed on is does that matter in any way shape or form can you get a really great deal because the uh Two hundred thousand dollar house went into foreclosure, so now you can probably get it for one hundred and ten thousand dollars just because the bank wants to get something. That um, that in the past that may have been true, but okay. I would say now in the market we're in, it's not. Why they, the banks are actually paying to have full blown appraisals on these properties before they relist it. So they've already done a market appraisal that they paid probably at least three hundred bucks for to know right where they're going to relist it. And then they look at comps from the listing agent and they relist it accordingly. And they do not come off of those prices. In this market right now, we're seeing they do not reduce those prices till it's been on the market for at least you know 90 days or a fair amount of time. And we're seeing where they price them. They're usually getting multiple offers. So okay. a lot of times they're a good deal. Sometimes they're not. You know, you have to look at everything. We, we had a client that... Um, Jodine was actually showing him a property and she's like, he loves this property. It needs so much work. She's like, come look at it and see what you think. I looked at it and I'm like, there's no way you can't even do an FHA 203K on this thing. It's more than 35 grand in renovations. It's, it's going to take so much just to bring this property back up to code, you know, and the bank's thinking it's worth this and they're not going to get it. That property is for a cash buyer that can sink another 50 grand in it at least right? just to make it up to par. So somebody like that might make a good, they might, you know, get a good deal out at it because a property like that one I just described might be open pretty much just to cash buyers because of financing. Like you can't get a traditional loan because the property is in such rough shape, you know? Right. It wouldn't pass inspections or right. whatever. So we're not seeing them really the stellar deals they used to be. Yes, you might be able to get a deal, but we're seeing, you know, if the, if the value, like let's say it appraises at 140, which they're not going to tell you what the appraisal is. They do it for their own valuation. You know, they may list it at 125 because they know as soon as that property hits the market, it's going to open the floodgates. And then what happens is if they've listed at 125 and they have multiple offers, the bank will come back and say, yeah, we're in a multiple offer situation. They'll have you sign an addendum that says they told you that. And then they'll say, give us your highest and best by Friday at noon or what, you know, whatever that deadline is, 24 or 48 hours from that time. And so they will typically, once they pick the highest and best, they'll enter into negotiations with that client. Okay. Now, is there a better time of year when it comes to, you know, for, for cars, for example? Yeah. The best time to buy a car is like September, October, because the 2015s are coming out, so you can get a great deal on a 2014. Right. Is there any... Wow. 
It Anything de- like that? It depends on who you are and what you're looking for. And the reason why I say that is if you're one of these people that has to look through every single thing, like just to make sure that you got the best deal and you looked at all these properties and, you know, this is the one for the price. This is it. I've been looking for two years and this is the one, you know, that buyer might want to wait till summertime because there's typically more inventory over the summertime when people are moving and kids are out of school and that kind of stuff than there might be in, you know, November or December for the holidays. A lot of people actually might even take their house off the market during that time period because the holidays are here. And if they're living in there, it might be a little bit of an inconvenience. Sure. You know, because again, the seller has to pack everything up, keep the house clean, vacate for an hour, let random people are in their house to see it and then come back, you know, and then maybe start dinner at seven or eight o'clock at night. (laughs) So there really isn't a better time of year, but... Yeah. Like you said, I would say get it, you know, might. to answer that question, I wouldn't say a better time over another. Like if you know, you might get a seller that's desperate right before the holidays and they're not gonna take their house off the market because they have to sell it. And then so you might get a good deal on something like that. But you know, you might not have had as many options to pick from, if that makes sense. Like using your same example as far as buying a car, if you buy it at the end of the year. Most of those year models are going to be already gone. But if you buy it at the beginning of the year, you're, there uh, there's a whole bunch every color every year. Right. But if you know if you're buying something that close out the end of the year, you know you might get a great deal on the car, but it might be yellow. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> right? And nobody nobody wants a yellow car. Well, you know like, what I mean. You might get a purple house. I mean, That's who right. wants a purple house with pink shutters? But you got what I'm saying, right? You got the point. <laughs> yeah, it's just like. Uh, Katrina Barbie? Is this like Tampa Barbie with a purple house the, with pink shutters? The pink. Barbie pink. Hot pink. <laughs> Malibu Barbie. <laughs> so you're listening to Tampa Home Talk. I want to give you our off-air number just in case you want to call in or pick my brain a little bit more. You didn't have a chance to ask your question. And that number is 813-936-2302. 813-936-2302. That's our off-air number. You can call us there and ask us anything at all that you would like to know. Um, you know, if you're a veteran, take advantage of those zero down programs because it really is one of the best ones out there. Uh, for sale by owners, we get that one a lot too. I would say buyer beware on those because for sale by owner, there might be a lot of reasons why they don't want to work with an agent. Sometimes we've seen cases of sellers where they don't want to fill out a property disclosure. And if they work with a realtor, we are going to have them do a property disclosure and... If they haven't done that, then uh, usually a good realtor is going to walk away. So just be leery about that. Sometimes also the um, house might be overpriced. So, you know, realtor is going to provide comparables or comparative market analysis or data on what other similar homes have sold for. But the seller might say no. You know, we might say it's worth 150, but he might say I want 200. So just be leery about that stuff because you might have expenses like home inspection or an appraisal and you don't get any of those things back. So I would say be leery about that kind of stuff. And that, you know, and we've actually seen cases on for sale by owners where they would even try to talk the buyer into not getting an inspection. Oh, no, the house is fine. This is great. We've cared for it. We've done every little thing around the house wow. that needs People to be fixed. You don't need a home inspection. You'd be surprised. Wow. You know, you're meeting Sally and Joe Smith, and they seem like the nicest people in the world. And they're just moving because they want to go up north with their grandkids, right? I mean, you never know. <laughs> People have all kinds of reasons and, and motives, and, you know, that's, it could be another whole legal issue for another day on what could happen if they didn't tell the truth. But <laughs> Wow. Anything else? Any closing thoughts there, Chris? In the first I'm good. Home I'm, world? I'm gonna I'm gonna try to refrain from jumping at the first house that I look at. But Definitely I'll be sure to was. give you I'll be sure to give you a call before I do. That's right. I'll be working with us at Tampa Home <laughs> Talk. We'd love to have you. We'd love to have the person listening. If you miss any part of our show today, you can check it out in its entirety at TampaHomeTalk.com. We're also available on a podcast via phone and the web. Just look up for us at Tampa Home Talk. Thanks so much for joining us today as we talked about the first time home buyer arena and some the things that they see we really enjoyed having you catch us here next week every thursday and saturday at 5 p.m for this week we're out